Okay, we'll set it up uh, so recording's that you beginning. Are... Anybody out there, I'm letting you know we're, we are <laughs> recording. So if you have any problems with that, you can do whatever you want. Turn off your camera, um, turn off your mic, or just leave <laughs> if you want your, your name to be seen or whatever. So it's being recorded right now. So great. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Welcome to our adult call forum. Playful call, exploring the intersection of games and technology in language education. We are currently spanning at least three time zones until Hannah's here. Good morning, Hannah. So we have four time zones. <laughs> James York and I are here in Japan, uh, Tokyo and Osaka, respectively. Vance Stevens is coming to us from Penang, Malaysia. Hannah Kamis is here from Cairo, Egypt. Hannah, say hi. Hello, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Too early for that. But fine. Yes, it is a yeah. good morning. Hannah and I are program chairs for the uh, Jolt Call SIG. So thanks, Hannah, for getting up so early and helping out today. So let's get right to it. Each speaker will have 20 minutes to do their talks, which leaves us with about 15 minutes at the end for questions. Um, now it's time to introduce our third speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, we're in for a real treat today. Listen to James and Deborah. Now, let me introduce Dan Stevens, our guest speaker, a man who's been the driving force behind uh, TESOL International uh, Electronic Village Online and Call uh, Intersection. Uh, he's actually uh, worked with generations and generations of keen we call webheads because he's the founder of that webheads and the later community now called learning together well he claims that he's retired i don't believe you are retired Vance. so allow me to disagree uh, so we're, we're in for um, a very interesting outlook on uh, a game he actually uh, has done a lot of work on and trains again um, you know, a group of uh, teachers, I'm sure they are quite uh, a number in EVO, which is Electronic Village Online. Uh, please join me in giving a very warm welcome to our speaker, um, uh, Van Stevens. The title of his um, uh, segment here, presentation, is about leveraging learning, uh, language learning through the participatory culture surrounding Minecraft. You uh, take it away from here, dear Vance. Okay, well, thank you very much. Am I audible, visible, everything okay? Thumbs up? Everything looks good. Okay, all right. I've started my timer. So uh, I'm talking, as uh, Hannah said, about leveraging language learning through participatory culture surrounding Minecraft. And I have slides uh, and a write-up. I always do both. Um, that's so if I waffle a bit and we don't quite get to the end of it, you can read to the end and the end part is presenting data and stuff like that. So that's as easily read as me telling you about it. But basically, if you want to bring the slides up, you'll find that in the slides you've got on your screen, all the links are hyperlinked and there's a QR code if you're really fast. Okay. Because I've got to move on in my presentation. We're being closely timed here. So, the purpose of uh, my presentation, I guess this is the most important thing, is that what I stress in what I do in Electronic Village Online and EVO Minecraft MOOC, which I've been doing since 2015, is to bring teachers into uh, this uh, dynamic of, uh, of gameplay. And by it's important that the teachers have to be in the game in order to understand what's going on there. So that's the part of the description that I would just like to stress right now. So now this presentation is not going to explain what EVO is, Electronic Village Online, or what uh, EVO Minecraft MOOC is, but I gave that presentation at the TESOL virtual uh, conference just recently. And just like I've done for this presentation, you can watch the video. It's right there in the slides you may have up on your screen now. Uh, it's a 20-minute video. 
and you can also see the slides themselves and you can read the write-up. And if you're interested in, and, we, and in the video, I've included videos themselves, videos of us playing Minecraft. So all that kind of explanation is there. What I'm planning to do, uh oh, uh oh, sorry, I'm trying to move ahead. How do I move ahead? Okay. There we go. <laughs> sorry about that. I just clicked on the window and it played the video. Okay, so um, here, uh, we. what I'm going to talk about today is why, as I said, why you have to play Minecraft in order to understand its use in language learning and how gamification and games-based learning encourage students to spend time on their goals and how Minecraft helps people to do that. And I have a sort of a skewed interpretation of gamification, which I'll present as well. And the last thing I'm going to do is talk about uh, what teachers have said about how they use Minecraft in their, uh, uh, you know, in their, in their teaching. And just to give you uh, an overview of the presentation so you'll know what's coming. I'm going to talk first about a book that Nicholas Carr wrote about uh, the called The Glass Cage. He has an interesting description there about uh, his getting into the flow in a game that, anyway, that, that's, uh, it just shows you a little bit about how game design uh, can contribute to learning and gamification. And then I talk about James Paul G's distinction between big G and little g games. Basically, uh, as far as Minecraft is concerned, Minecraft is a little g game, the software, and the big G game is learning languages, if that's what we're doing, or learning what areas you want them to learn. And then I, I try to explain how Minecraft, in my view, has both game-based and gamified elements. So I'll show you some examples there. And finally, as I said, what teachers say about these things. Okay, so Nicholas Carr's book on the glass cage is about uh, automation in, uh, uh, well, it's a follow on from the shallows. And you can read the book yourself. There is a full text version. And if you want to bring it up, you could, you could scroll down there to uh, interlude. Uh, the interlude has to do with red, red, Red Dead Redemption. This is a video game that uh, Nicholas Carr apparently was writing as a break from the, the book that he wanted to, um, um, you know, that he, while, he's, while he's writing his book, he probably he took breaks and got into Red, De Red Redemption. And he learned some things about how he was pulled into the flow of this. So it's a very sophisticated game, as you can see from these screenshots. And uh, it basically, he, he writes about how he's formed an alliance with a grave robber named Seth Breyers. And he needs Seth to take him to some people he needs to move on in his game. And, but in order for Seth to do that, he has to drive a load, a cartload of fresh corpses uh, to a town called Tumbleweed. So he says, I drove Seth's horse-drawn wagon while he stayed in the back, rifling the dead for valuables. Uh, when he tried to cross a rickety bridge, the weight of the body shifted and he lost control of the horses. And he did this over and over again, and he kept dying at this, uh, at this point. But he's, he kept into it so assiduously that he eventually solved the problem. And here's the takeaway from that. He, he says later on in that interlude that video games tend to be loathed by people who never played them. And, but he's, he, his point is that they're a model for the design of software. They encourage development of skills in kind of the ways that um, uh, Deborah has been talking about. Uh, you get challenges of increasing difficulty. Uh, there are rewards for doing well. And flow is very important. And people who don't play video games don't experience flow in this connection. That's why it's so difficult unless you actually get into a game and play it, why it's so difficult to understand really what we're talking about here. So now then, another interlude, my own interlude, what is gamification? Uh, there's been some discussion about this in uh, our pre-forum uh, chats with one another. Uh, the the uh, 
definition that I see most often is gamification is the application of game design elements and game principles in non-game contexts, which, okay, I, I accept that. But I found a website, gamify.com, which adds a little coda there. It also says it can be, uh, oops, sorry about that. It can be also designed as a uh, set of activities and processes to solve problems by using or applying the characteristics of game elements. And also, that's, a, that's one little uh, cadge on that principle. And another one is what exactly is a game? So games, as I pointed out, go from big G to little g, or vice versa. So I see Minecraft as being the, a little g game in the big G game of language learning. So if you're playing that game, you're, you're in the game. Uh, it's, it's hard to tell where the game-based elements are and which game they're affecting. So uh, I've, there's a blog post I wrote about uh, James Paul G. And you can click there if you want to read more about it. The, this idea of the game, like the game of school, for example, has been around a while. I, I came upon this reference by uh, Robert Fried in 2005. And I was interested in that because I was looking for Steve Hargadon's take on the game of school, which is something more recent. I think he started this in 2019. But his idea is that students play the game of school. They learn how to play the game of school without really learning how to play the big G game of life. And he, his uh, project here is, is a, an exploration of that. So if you're going to talk about gamification and what's the games-based context, you have to maybe expand your definition of games because in a way it's all a game. So the gamification applies ah, across the board. How do you like that? Did I weasel my way out of that distinction. Okay. In my point of view, Minecraft has both games-based and games... Um, sorry, I'm trying to see my screen. Okay, both games-based and uh, gamified elements. And one example, there's a, there's a link here at the lower left of this slide, a uh, phishing data collection uh, scenario that was described in uh, VSTE Minecraft Monday, that's Virginia Society for Technology and Education. And they set up, uh, and by the way, we are teachers who go into Minecraft to learn how to use it with students. And so they showed us this game where they taught us how to fish. Uh, and fishing itself is a gamified activity in Minecraft in my view. And they, in Discord, they posted a spreadsheet, a Google Docs spreadsheet, and we were supposed to go through and uh, record the number of fish we caught, where we caught them, that sort of thing, what we caught them with. And this is, it's irrelevant for this particular context, but it's something that you could apply. You can see how a teacher can use Minecraft to devise some data-driven learning. Another good example, Minecraft is a platform for a game, another VST uh, uh, webinar, is where teachers created a house and they stored ancient scrolls and chests in the house. And the students came along and had to retrieve the pieces of scrolls and mount them on the walls and then reorganize them so that the message emerged. The students really got into this. We had some students here doing this. And the pieces stored in the chests all make part of a larger story. And this is, has, it could be for a literature class or it could be, oh, I haven't started my video. There we go. <laughs> okay, so um, it, it could be for lots of different uh, subject matters, but it certainly lends itself well to language. And again, it's an example of manipulating Minecraft as a platform for games-based learning. So then for gamification, in my view, uh, Minecraft is full of gamified elements. And in the sense that in the definition of gamification, where it's to solve problems using characteristics of game elements. And phishing is a good example. Um, so everything you do in Minecraft sort of adds to your abilities. Uh, for example, you're attacked by mobs. One of the mobs is spiders. When you kill spiders, a simple thing to do you get their string. When you get their string, you can craft other items. So you can make fishing poles, as you can see here. You can also make bows and arrows. So once you start fishing, 
you get experience points for fishing. You don't only catch fish, you might catch other things like books, uh, enchanted books, for example. You can see one in the lower left uh, graphic. So you might find a book that would help you enchant an item. And you can also use fish to tame cats. Cats will bring you feathers at night. With feathers, you can make arrows. Or you can trade with villages to get emeralds and exchange them for arrows. And this is kind of interesting, so I'll show you this. Now, there's a link here at the bottom of this video, which is queued to, it's from my uh, uh, TSALT 21 virtual presentation. So if you go to that place in the video, you'll see us walking around and going up these stairs and finding these villagers here who have things to trade. You right click on a villager and that villager shows you what he has to trade. That can be a sheep. So um, emeralds is the coin of the realm in this kind of trading. But if you had say, say the string and you want, you can trade 44 strings to a fisherman so he can make his fishing poles and you, okay, he'll give you an emerald. Uh, you can then go next door to the Fletcher and you can give him an emerald and he'll give you 16 arrows, which is kind of hard to get in Minecraft because uh, arrows are, are difficult to craft. You have to get flint, that's the main part. So anyway, you can read more about this uh, at, uh, at some of the links that you see on this page. So now what, in, in the presentation that I mentioned earlier in the virtual conference, we did a tour of Minecraft and we had teachers meet us in Minecraft. Uh, mostly it was um, moderators. There was also a lady named Kamala who was a non-native uh, English speaker participant in our course. And at the bottom of that page, you see a link to the transcripted data. I put that, so I'll change that. So I like these dynamic uh, uh, slideshows. So I transcribed the whole conversation and I then divided the, um, uh, the different categorizations of my, of the kinds of things that teachers talked about and these links actually work and they take you to Stevens 2021, which is where I uh, wrote more on this topic earlier. But it's not so well organized as I, I'm trying to do right now. Uh, what I'm trying to do for this presentation, I took these categories and I made three broad categories and I color coded it for you to make it a little easier for you to follow. So the red are the three, are the categories. There's paradigm shifts in teaching and learning. And then there are subcategories under that in blue. So where you see blue text, those are subcategories under the main text. And the three categories are paradigm shifts in language teaching and learning, target language acquisition, and life and literacy skills. What the teachers said about how their students were learning uh, these aspects from playing Minecraft. Okay, so we're going to the first one, paradigm shifts in teaching and learning. And the two things that I identified there, how teachers and students depart from traditional learning. This is, uh, came up a lot in our conversation. Uh, Don Carroll, one of our moderators, said that you have to move away from traditional ideas of language teaching. Oh, and by the way, this is all taken in context. So you can, you can find the context in other links, the links I showed you earlier. Uh, you can find the whole transcript. But Excerpting from what he said, he said that uh, you, you don't necessarily start with the past tense and then try to teach that in Minecraft, but language kind of emerges from Minecraft. I'll talk more about that in a moment. But um, Minecraft isn't like, okay, I'm going to teach these language points. Rather, I'm, I'm going to play Minecraft and the language will come in through that. So it's, it's acquisition, which uh, we can assume occurs, but then in this part of the presentation, I'll show you where I've actually got some uh, qualitative data to corroborate that. So uh, a lot of people ask about well, where is Minecraft in the curriculum? And the answer is that the curriculum is in it. I heard that in the podcast one time and I keep repeating it. Um, Mariana Smolchitz has a son named Phil, two sons actually, Philip and Domovoy. And uh, she's worked, she, she wrote an article uh, about how her sons became fluent in English using Minecraft by playing uh, the game with students, they're in Croatia, so they, they, they speak Croatian and their father doesn't speak English 
and they um, so so they learned basically through interacting with other students in the participatory culture around Minecraft. And then Mariana pointed out that they also like to teach you, that kids love to explain what they're doing. And they learn more, she thought, because uh, you're using, they're using you to force them to use the language. So those are just some snippets of evidence from the transcripts. But another interesting thing that I put in departure from uh, normal teaching and learning is the family and community aspects. So Minecraft is a, uh, family endeavor in EVO Minecraft book. A lot of the participants, or a lot of the participants and the moderators bring their children in and they like to explore how the children learn in the virtual world. So it's all kind of pitched in as kind of a family activity. Three minutes, okay. Vance. Oh, thank you. Yes, I've got it there. Okay, so um, the next thing is about target language acquisition. Some evidence for acquisition around the game and uh, opportunities for language acquisition abound in Minecraft, as uh, our, the people in our chats talked about that. And then there's also vocabulary and spelling and understanding accented language, which I found was kind of an interesting uh, aspect that I hadn't really thought about. But I told you that Mariana had written an article about her how her son, um, so her both her sons became quite fluent in English, and Philip from playing Minecraft. So he had to figure out things in the language by wanting to learn more about these things. And Don Carroll interjected, um, if, you if you sit and watch a video, it's, you know what's happening in terms of the action. So that helps you to make more sense of the language. Now, I actually traveled to Croatia and I met Philip and Mariana there and Philip told me that when they first started learning about Minecraft, they would watch the videos. And at first the language meant nothing to them. It was just gibberish. They were doing more what Don is talking about. They, were, uh, they knew what was happening in terms of the action. But Philip told me that as he watched more videos in about Minecraft, that the language emerged. I really like that. That to me is really acquisition. Acquisition. Now, Jane talks about also other vocabulary and spelling. Uh, you you can, uh, in your inventory, you can see items, you can mouse over them, they're spelled out for you. Kamala talks about how she um, had to negotiate language with uh, people that she was playing in the game. She learned her vocabulary mainly through games playing because she learned vocab vocabulary in certain contexts, but she had to get at the real meaning of the games. And the accented language is another um, uh, aspect that I hadn't really thought about, but the students who are in Europe are being exposed to each other's accents um, frequently. Now I'm gonna flip on through my slides. You can read about this in the write-up, but life and literacy skills uh, also talk about, I'll just skip through the explanations. Um, autonomy is promoted. That's important because it shouldn't stop a teacher from using Minecraft that the teacher doesn't know so much about Minecraft. The, the, the autonomy comes from the students. And a lot of it is the critical thinking that's involved, the problem solving. So you have to predict what you're doing and uh, it's constantly engaging you that way. And there's just in time learning all the time. So people are always trying to learn what they need to do right now. They use the language for reflection. Maddie, Jane's son, kept a blog and wrote in, uh, uh, print literacy, but Mariana's sons made videos, uh, YouTube. So computer literacy skills is also uh, important. Um, Don says that there's a full complete package of literacy skills and language that goes together. Typing skills, another one I didn't really think about so much, but typing skills is also a literacy skill that apparently Minecraft helped uh, Mariana's son uh, win a competition in. Okay, here are some references. There are more references in my write-up. Um, here are the slides, just as a reminder to you. And uh, you can read what I said, or what I meant to say, in uh, these links. Okay, I hope that didn't go too over time. All right, great, thank you. Now that was perfect. 
I'm going to switch to my slides. I realize I did my intro without slides. It wasn't a whole lot, but I'll start with slides now. Share screen. Okay. Continue. Unshare this. I'll just. Okay. Here. 